Aloha. Good morning and welcome to Unity Church. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this is the day which we have been given. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. If this is your very first time at Unity Church Unitarian, you are welcome here. If you are joining us online, we are so glad you are with us. You are in the room with us, and we are holding you through this service. If you have come here seeking to be spiritually nourished, you are welcome here. My name is Peggy Lynn. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm serving as today's worship associate. I'm so glad first that One Voice Mixed Chorus is with us this morning to bring their beautiful music. <laughs> and I'm also delighted to welcome our guest minister, the Reverend Justin Schroeder. <laughs> uh, Reverend Schroeder is, of course, no stranger to Unity Church. He was formerly an intern and served on Unity's staff served as senior co-minister at First Universalist Church in Minneapolis, and is now currently co-founder of Holding Space for Change with his wife, Juliana Keene. Justin, we are delighted that you have returned to Unity's pulpit this morning. I want to extend a special welcome to those of you who are visiting us today. If you are new to Unity Church, please fill out one of the visitor cards that are available in the pews and drop it in the offering basket as it passes you by later in the service. We hope you find Unity Church to be a place that helps you find and keep your balance and a community that inspires you to lead a loving life of integrity, service, and joy. Your gifts and your wounds are welcome here. We center ourselves for worship now with the pealing of the bell.
We come together this morning to remind one another to rest for a moment on the forming edge of our lives, to resist the headlong tumble into the next moment until we claim for ourselves awareness and gratitude, taking the time to look into one another's faces and see their communion, the reflection of our own eyes. This house of laughter and silence, memory and hope, is hallowed by our presence together. Please join me in saying the words printed in your order of service that we use when we light our chalice. We light this chalice as a symbol of our faith, the light of truth and the warmth of love. Please join me in our responsive reading. It's 515 in the back of that gray hymnal. We lift up our hearts in thanks. For the sun and the dawn, which we did not create. The moon and the evening, which we did not create. 
for food which we plant but cannot grow, friends and loved ones we have not earned and cannot have. For this gathered community which welcomes us as we are from wherever we have come. For all our three churches that keep us human and encourage us in our quest for beauty, truth, and love. For all things which come to us as gifts of being from sources beyond ourselves. Every time this community gathers for worship, it sets aside time, a moment, to expand the caring ministry of this congregation. We take a moment to settle ourselves, to pause, to breathe, to enter a time of meditation, reflection, or prayer, as is your practice. This morning, we have not received any names to include in our embracing meditation. However, we know that our human condition includes the truth that on any given Sunday, there may be one or more among us facing a serious illness and others who are mourning the loss of a friend or a beloved. There may be among us one who is struggling with mental health and another who is trying to embody and embrace the delightful and challenging spiritual practice of raising children. There may be among us this morning those who are worried about making ends meet, who are looking for work. There may be others among us who are concerned about a loved one in prison, there may be among us this morning those, and I would say there are among us this morning, those who have hurt themselves and others by their addiction. And there are those among us who are celebrating another day of recovery. There may be among us one or more who are facing their final days. We support them in this time of transition that requires curiosity, courage, and honesty. We hold in care all of these and more as we pray for the peoples of this courageous congregation as together we live into our longing to embody and help build beloved community. I invite you now to speak into this holy sanctuary or into the silence of your own hearts, the names of those whom you wish to lift up in our collective embrace. Holy One, Spirit of life and love, source beyond all naming, yet called by so many names. You know the yearnings and the prayers and the heartaches we carry.
be with us now as we rest in this space together. Let this be a time and a place where we do not need to be efficient or productive or pretend that we have it all together. Help us simply rest in this space to be here. To be here with one another, to be here with our uncertainty, with our joy, our grief, our gratitude, our compassion, with all that we carry. May our breath anchor and ground us. May we open ourselves to hear what might heal us, to take in what might transform us, to wrestle with what might bless us, and to listen deeply for the wisdom and compassion that resides within, among, and beyond us. Amen. For this next anthem, I'd like to invite you to uh, join me in singing it. But first, I want to tell you the three tenets to keep in mind. This is a piece called Wade by Samantha Rise, who is um, a black non-binary song catcher, as they call themselves. And all the music they write uh, follows these three tenets. The first tenet is, music is your birthright. The second tenet is, Your voice belongs as it is. You belong as you are. And the third tenant is, we can't be afraid and sing at the same time. That may be a lie. (laughs) The words to this are, when the world is sick, can no one be well? Yet, I dreamt we were beautiful and strong. So I'll sing it over and over. As you start to get it in your body, please join me. When the world is sick, can no one be well? Yet I dreamt we were beautiful and strong. When the world is sick, can no one be well? Yet I dreamt we were beautiful and strong.
The reading this morning is The Clearing by Martha Postlewaite. Do not try to save the whole world or do anything grandiose. Instead, create a clearing in the dense forest of your life and wait there patiently until the song that is your life falls into your own cupped hands and you recognize and greet it. Only then will you know how to give yourself to this world. So do you believe in magic? Oh, I do. Apparently a bunch of you do as well. And I love it. And do you want to know what I think is the most magical, mysterious, wonderful, breathtaking thing in the entire world? And this is where I hope you're saying yes or else the sermon's kind of over. <laughs> do you know what is the most amazing, magical thing? Do you want to know? what that is, yes. I think that any place, any person, any thing can be magic and shimmery and alive, radiant. Anything can catch our heart and attention and hold it fast. This idea, this idea that any place and anything can be magic was one of the frameworks that I really leaned into while we were traveling several years ago on the road in a used RV. Truth be told, I left the Twin Cities in that RV with this grand vision of seeing a bucket list of things. Olympic National Park, the Oregon coast, things I'd never seen before, redwood forests, Joshua Tree, the Grand Canyon, just those were a few of the things on my bucket list. And we did make it to some of those places, and they were magical, but again and again, I was reminded, often by our kids, mostly by our kids, that any place, when you show up and bring your full attention to that place, can be magical. And truthfully, my children have been teaching me this lesson since they were little. In fact, when our firstborn was two years old, we went on this long-awaited trip to the beach on the coast of North Carolina, after a long drive from my mother-in-law's house in Durham, we finally arrived and we parked on a sandy road a few blocks from the beach and we started to unload the cooler and the chairs and the toys and all these things. And our son, our two-year-old son, unbuckled himself from the car seat. He'd been holding a little sand pail and a shovel the whole drive, like very ready for the beach. And he plunked himself down in the sand next to the car and started digging. I love the beach, <laughs> he said to us, ready to play all day in the sand by the side of this busy road. He was disappointed and a little frustrated when we told him that this wasn't the beach and we still had a little ways to walk. But he had found magic right where he was. Thinking of this story, when we were on our RV road trip, we developed a mantra, this mantra of we can find magic anywhere. And it was true. In South Dakota, instead of the Badlands being the only magic, it was also the White River, this river that was just a short walk from the KOA RV campground we were in. And this river contained this clay, kind of white clay, that we found and played with and molded balls and other structures and then dried out and took with us <laughs> as we traveled thousands of miles. Everything got kind of dusty as they fell apart in our little storage compartment, but it reminded us of the magic of White River. In Utah, Arches National Park was nice, but it was the normal rocks near our campsite that became magic. They were a pirate ship. Then, a safe zone when the ground was lava. Then, seats to rest on for one of the best sunsets we've seen. 
I'm sure you have your own moments of any place is magical. And so in that regard, I doubt I'm sharing anything new with you this morning. Instead, I hope I'm reminding you of something you already know, which is part of why we come to church, I think, to be reminded of those things we may have forgotten, those things we've lost track of, those things we've hurried past. So the reminder is straightforward. Attention to a place, to the land, to the sky, to the birds, to the insects, whatever is there, it can make any place magical. And people too, paying attention to them, not as we like them to be or think they should be, but as they actually are, can be a magical and heart-opening experience as well. When we pay attention, when we recognize and greet the song within us, or recognize and greet that song within another, or the song of a particular place, that can be such a joyous experience. The root of the word attention has to do with applying one's mind or directing one's energies. It requires a kind of focus to be with what is, whether it's your breath or your feelings or the landscape or the person who's right in front of you, to see and experience that entity as new and fresh, to not let it become stale, like, oh, I, I know that thing, or I've seen this before, but to see it new and fresh again and again. And here's the challenge in all of this, the rub, really. It's easy for me to stand up here and to say, paying attention matters. But the truth is that paying attention is not easy. There are a billion things distracting us. And on top of that, we're wired, as human beings, we're wired to look for novelty, sort of things outside the normal range, those things that give us kind of a dopamine hit, and we're wired to look for danger. And thus, we miss some of the subtle beauty, the more mundane magic, if you will, that exists right in front of us when we pay attention. The outcome of this is that we are frequently pulled away from attending maybe to our inner lives or from being in the actual place we are or from seeing the actual people who are right in front of us. Both my wife Juliana and I have been thinking a lot about attention, especially as it relates to our new practice as we accompany people as they move through really big life transitions. What we notice people sharing with us in our therapy and spiritual, practice, spiritual direction work is an awareness that they would like to pay more attention to their inner lives and they are finding it nearly impossible to do on their own. So this is the heart of what we're doing in our practice. We are working to hold space for people to pay attention, to make a clearing in the dense forest of their life so they can listen for the song that is their life. And that work, anywhere, anytime, is holy, sacred work. But it is hard work. If you're like me, it can be a struggle to pay deep attention to oneself or anything else. And friends, there's a reason it's a struggle. Our attention is the most valuable thing we have. And Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, X, Google, and so many other websites and apps all make money by stealing our attention. As author Catherine Price explains, focusing on our inner lives and the world around us isn't profitable for these companies, but distraction and stealing our attention is. These companies pay big bucks to hijack and monetize our attention, attention, hoping that we'll endlessly swipe and scroll and refresh and purchase. When we reclaim our attention, when we direct it with intention, life can become magical because attention is the gateway to joy and connection and wonder. So let me share a practice that can help the magic appear more often. I'm guessing some of you have heard of the Jewish philosopher Martin Buber. He is best known for his writings and teachings on I-Thou, 
and I-it relationships, the two fundamental ways that human beings sort of relate to the world, I-thou and I-it. And that language, even as I say it now, I realize it probably feels a little clunky, I-thou and I-it. So stick with me here. I'll try to unclunk that for you. When Buber talks about an I-thou relationship, he is pointing to a, a, to a very deep, authentic relationship between entities. It could be people, but it doesn't have to be another person, between entities that honors the other as they are, precious and irreducible. In an I-thou relationship, the other, the thou, could be a person, but it could also be a tree or a goldfinch or anything that is outside of you but is a part of creation just like you. In an I-thou relationship, you're not better or above or superior than the thing that you're in relationship with. There's a sense of equal footing, of inherent worthiness, of connection and mutual respect and knowing that you both come from the same source. An I-it relationship, by contrast, involves a kind of objectification or exploitation or even manipulation. The it only exists for the benefit of the I. So the tree only exists because I can get wood from it to build a house or do whatever I need to do. The it exists only for the benefit of the I, and it's used as an instrument or a means that benefit the I. Does that make sense, the I-thou, the I-it? Okay. So I-thou points to this mutual, respect-filled relationship that honors maybe the, the deepest truth that we come from the same source. I-it points to a relationship where the thing is simply there for your benefit. It's an extractive relationship. And obviously, human beings move between those two orientations all the time. Just how, again, part, partly how we're wired. But when we more actively engage in that I-thou framework, deeply attending to another, to a place, to a thing, that can open the door to those magical, holy moments. And so I find that I-thou framework very helpful. I find it to be a key that can unlock some of the magic. And this morning, I want to share a concrete example of an I-thou experience that I had just a few weeks ago. Actually, I had it here in this sanctuary just a few weeks ago. So three weeks ago was Barbara Hubbard's retirement Sunday and her, her sermon to the congregation, kind of marking her decades of service to this congregation. And I was in that back pew, kind of like right under the, the, the uh, choir loft there. So I see some folks back there. That's where I was, right back there. Yeah, you were waving at me back there. And sitting back there in that back pew, I really started to feel and sense the magic of this place coming alive in me. As I listened to Barbara, as I thought about the history of this congregation and the memories I have and that are held in this sanctuary, and I let all of that wash over me. I wasn't asking anything of this space. I wasn't demanding that it do anything for me. I wasn't trying to use it for some other end. I was simply resting here, giving this space my full attention and tuning in to all that was happening, all of the currents. When Barbara said, Jan was the heart of the church and Rob was the vision, she was right. And she was being humble, I think, because she did not name herself as a kind of steady backbone or spine in this congregation, one who gently held the administry of this place, the numbers and the facilities, the day-to-day -day operations so that everything else could flourish. And so I felt that and thought about that, and sitting back there, I really honestly heard this sanctuary whispering to me, and it whispered this, heart, vision, and backbone are nothing without a flesh and blood body. And that's when I really started to encounter and feel the power and the strength and the magic of this living body, you all, this congregation, every single one of you. 
It is true that ministers like Frederick May Elliott and Arthur Foote and Roy Phillips and Rob and Jan Eller Isaacs, they were all a part of this body of the church. They tended to it. But ministers come and go, and it is the body that remains. So sitting there three weeks ago feeling love and joy and grief, the whole mess of it, I thought, it's so ordinary and miraculous, this thing, this body. You all choosing to be here. You all doing your religious and spiritual life together, holding one another. Yes, I felt very real grief about Rob and Jan's death and Barbara's retirement and joy for Barbara, too. But as I paid attention that day, what I felt most in that packed sanctuary was the power and the promise of this body. This body that has been through countless transitions before and has thrived, flourished, and deepened. The church body is its own living entity, a thou, if you will. And I felt the glory and the wonder of that. I share this story about the magic of this place in part because I imagine there must be a great deal of excitement and anticipation and uncertainty as you approach Candidating Week with the Reverend Dr. Oscar Sinclair, who will be here next Sunday. And amidst those feelings, I also hope you will notice and feel the strength and simple power, the magic that is the body of Unity Church. So the loving framework I'd offer for Candidating Week is really no different than the loving framework I would offer for your day-to-day -day life. And that is this. Pay attention. See one another as sacred and holy. Notice what moves you, what moves in your spirit. Name it. Notice what makes you feel alive and follow that. Put it into words. Share that with others and listen to others and what they are noticing as well. Here's what I'm saying. A little summary at the end of the sermon, if you will. As much as you can, pay attention to all that is unfolding in your life, in the life of this faith community, and listen deeply for the song that is your life. And notice how that song may be connected to the song of Unity Church's life, and how those songs might be connected to the song that is at the heart of Oscar Sinclair's ministry. It's not fancy, any of this, but it does take work and awareness and focus. But this is how the magic can happen, anywhere, any place, with anyone. So do you believe in magic? I do. Let's let the magic begin. Amen. Your support of the church is an expression of the promises we make to each other and to the world. The contributions you make enable us to do the work we have pledged to do within our church community and out in the world. Today, the larger portion of our offering will be shared with Unity's Act for the Earth team. This team's mission is to engage the Unity community to act to stop climate change species extinction, and environmental injustice by practical and systemic solutions while grounding this work in our spiritual and anti-racist anti -racist justice stances. This collection will underwrite the purchase of various materials needed to implement the team's ongoing educational and lobbying program through the remainder of 2024. Will the ushers please come forward?
May the work of our hands and the generosity of our hearts be given in gratitude this day. Let the offering now be taken.
We hope that you have found rich meaning in today's service. We have just a couple announcements this morning. They are, if you would like to attend Finding Yourself at Unity, our weekly class for newcomers and inquirers, the conversation will take place today at 1015 in the Gannett Room, which is that way upstairs on the second floor. The topic this week is Unity's Social Justice and Community Outreach Ministries. This month, the Evergreen Quilters are hosting their biennial quilt sale and raffle in the Parish Hall. 100% of all quilt and raffle ticket sales are shared with Hallie Q. Brown Food Shelf, Jeremiah Transitional Housing Pro Program, and Project Home. Over the last eight years, Evergreen Quilters have donated over $33,000 to those organizations. Uh, you can buy quilts and raffle tickets and learn more about their art and work at their table in the Parish Hall every Sunday in April. And now I see a member of the ministerial search team who is standing by to give us an update about the MST and the upcoming candidating week with um, Reverend Oscar. Angela? Good morning. All right, uh, so I, I'm Angela Wilcox. On behalf of the ministerial search team, we wanna thank you for all the work you have done to show up over the course of the last year. Many of you came to our Wellspring Wednesday. Many, many of you have checked out um, Reverend Oscar's materials that are posted online, his website um, and videos. Those are being updated regularly, so keep checking back. He's answering questions that have come in from our congregation in short video blurbs, so uh, check those out. We will also have our table in the parish hall if you have questions. There is an insert in this week's order of worship with all of the dates for the public-facing candidating week events. Um, there's a bulletin board in the hallway, and you can always check out the website. So lots of ways to access information about what's coming up. I'll highlight that this coming Wednesday night, the ministerial search team and members of the Board of Trustees will be together to talk about how to engage in Candidating Week, when to engage, um, and some specifics about the, the congregational meeting and vote on April 21st. So if you have, and that will also be um, on Zoom. So Wednesday night, we hope to see you there. Thanks. Thanks, Angela. And now we will join in our closing hymn number 15.
Dear ones, as you rest on the edge of this threshold moment for this congregation, may you be blessed and may you be a blessing and may you discover the magic that is always, always available. May it be so and amen. amen. And will you join me in saying the words for the extinguish of our chalice? They are printed in your order of worship. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, and the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. All right, let's do it.